Well, hello everybody. Pastor Joel here with you one more time for the past days with Pastor Joel. That may have frightened you. It frightened me just a little bit. Well, we're going to get right into the video for today. This is number five and the last video in this series called Why We Believe What We Believe, which is essentially ask the question, how did we get to this place? So many of us where we started with a with a very similar idea of end times teaching that included uh, the rapture, the millennial kingdom, uh, the coming antichrist, um, that, that literally, you know, stars are going to fall from the heavens and, you know, decreation language is all literal and all of that. How, how did we get to this point? And I, I traced a little bit of the history, which can be helpful. I know I didn't know any of it. Um, when I when I first um, you know was a Christian or first came to these beliefs and it's helpful sometimes to know you know how we how we got someplace from history and trace that out we've looked a little bit at the rapture as it's commonly taught we've looked at the millennial kingdom and, and most recently we began looking at the nation of Israel which uh, looms so large really in any eschatological paradigm um, because Israel is, is usually seen as, as having some prominent role in that. Uh, but in terms of how that works out and the timing of that, that's where there are so many differing and divergent views. And, and I happen to believe that, that only fulfilled eschatology, a.k.a. preterism, solves uh, the Israel puzzle in a way that's very satisfactory and brings the scriptures together as a unified whole. But I would strongly recommend that you go back and listen to those prior videos. So far they've been some of those pop popular videos I've done, so they seem to have, be scratching an itch or something like that. So remember to uh, like and subscribe and, and share this content so that we can get it out as close as across the street and as far as across uh, the world so that we can have a, a world full of Christians who are who are good uh, Bereans and really love, um, love God's Word and love the God of the Word. Okay, so um, I want to date myself just a little bit here. Um, one of my, probably my favorite Star Trek series is the next generation, and I know now there have been like several series past them, but I just love Captain John Luc Picard and Gage. That's probably really lousy. I probably just lost half my subscribers, but uh, just loved his character and just a great, great show. I'd recommend that you that you go back and maybe check some of those out. This does actually tie in uh, not only a little bit to the nation of Israel, but but with um, what I've been talking about in terms of eschatology in general. So there were a couple episodes. Um, uh, you know, two-part episode called Chain of Command, a couple of my favorite. And in that, Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Starship Enterprise, if you're not a Star Trek fan, I'll try to tell this in a way that it will still be helpful for you. But he gets taken prisoner by the Kardashians, not talking about the modern show Kardashians, which I've thankfully never watched, uh, but he gets imprisoned by them and tortured. And in this room where he's being tortured, there are four lights, four very bright lights that are always on when he's being interrogated and he can easily see them and all he has to do in order to be released is say that there are five lights but he won't do it no matter how bad the pain is now how ex no matter how exhausted he is from the torture he simply will not comply there are four lights he insists even when he can barely get the words out because of his physical and mental exhaustion well, eventually he's reunited with the Starship Enterprise. Again, I promise, this, this will all come back uh, to tie in with eschatology. After he's reunited with his ship, one of the crew members there, she happens to be the crew counselor, Deanna Troy, and she's kind of, you know, she's kind of trying to, he's debriefing from this experience. And they're talking, and um, you know, he explains to her that as the process continued, he knew in his mind that there were only four lights. But by the end, he wasn't always quite sure and he thought maybe, maybe there were five. What does this have to do again with eschatology or my or my book that I'm sharing some of this, sharing this with you? It's not published yet, so if you're wondering about getting it, I'll let you know about that when it is. So please imagine me, if, if I were you know, sharing this with dispensationalists, or if you're sharing it with dispensational brothers and sisters, you know, say it quietly, say it gently, say it compassionately. 
Even when the plain reading of Scripture is right in front of us, in this case, there are four lights. If we keep being told over and over that there are five lights, we just might end up believing it. Oh no, when Jesus says this generation, he actually meant that generation. Oh no, 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 when Jesus talked about him coming soon, he meant coming soon always. It's like a carrot on a stick up in front of us so that every generation, whoever's there, they think he's coming soon. And it's a way to help us live morally. Oh no, no, when Peter in first, uh, you know, first Peter 4 verse 7 said, the end of all things is at hand, well clearly he, he must have meant something else. Or, or maybe he was... Maybe he was mistaken. After all, I mean, the apostles were often mistaken. By the way, let me interject interject my own conversation there and say something. I, and I don't. I wish I could give credit uh, to this author or whether it was something I saw on video. I honestly don't don't remember. This isn't something I was planning on sharing. It just came to mind. The reason in the New Testament that we know the apostles are confused about various things is because the text tells us they're confused. Okay, so in other words, like at one point, Jesus basically says, this is my own translation, he's like, you knotheads, don't you get it yet? You know, the reason we know they didn't get it is because Jesus told us in that case. So the other times when the disciples say, you know, the disciples are talking among themselves. And so the only reason we know that sometimes the disciples were confused about various things Jesus said is because the text tells us. Here's what's interesting. After Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, he's teaching them during that time. And then in John, I want to say 14, 16 Maybe wrong on the reference. I apologize if I am. It talks about the Holy Spirit coming, and one of the things the Holy Spirit um, was going to do is show the apostles about how these events were going to work out. And after that time, we don't see a hint of anything. There, there's absolutely nothing in any of those texts that would give us the impression that the apostles were confused, because they weren't. They got it. It all came to them at that point, and that's when they remembered then several things that Jesus had said earlier. So that's important. So we can't say, oh, well, the apostles were confused because by the time they're talking about his, his coming in those events, uh, they, they're, they're spot on, they're crystal clear at that point. But that's what happens. See, it sounds like Jesus said that even when we get to, get to the book of Revelation. And I think that's, um, I'm going to do a series of videos in Revelation, maybe the next videos that I do. But even there, you know, the very first verse, the events are to happen quickly. Oh, no, no, and that's not what it means. It means that, you know, way, way later, thousands of years later, probably in our time, it must be our generation, right? That when these things begin to happen, whoo, they're going to happen so fast. And so when we hear over and over that what looks like Jesus thought he was coming soon, what looked like the apostles thought he was coming soon, and judgment, and resurrection, all the rest, it looked like that, but no, 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 that's not what they meant. We end up like being... Picard in the scenario where he knew, you know, I'm, I'm, there's, there's four lights, but he keeps over and over hearing, no, there's five, there's five, there's five, there's five, there's five, and by the way, you better acquiesce. You better say what we're telling you to say. You better not question it, or you ain't getting out of here alive, <laughs> okay? Now, it may not be that drastic, but I have found that asking questions about eschatology in particular, I, I see the two areas, just in my experience, and maybe in this, in this time that we're in, because throughout the history of the church there have been different things at different times that, that came up that were huge issues that needed to be dealt with at that time. But right now, I think the two questions you better not ask questions about if you don't want to risk you know, losing some family members, losing some friends, maybe even losing your church, maybe even lose your pastorate, like I did, whatever you do, don't ask questions about soteriology or how are we shared in you know, the Calvin-Arminian debate. Don't, don't ask those questions. And for sure, do not ask questions about the popularly taught end times paradigm. And don't ask questions about Israel either. So let me just show you a little bit how this, how this plays out. What I've done here, and again, you might want to grab your Bible. Now, these are several texts. Uh, some of them I've gone through in, th in this video. Some of them I've gone through in other video series. Some of them I haven't, I haven't touched yet in the videos. But I would encourage you to write these down. And, and um, you know, they're more in the book. I'm not going to go over all of them. But this is the idea where we, we see what these scriptures actually say. This is the, the four lights. I, I can see it. We've got this other column here. The five lights say, no, 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 no. There can't be four. That can't possibly be what it means. Okay, so to jot these down, 
or follow along with me, but I'm going to move through them fairly rapidly. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken us to us by his son. That clearly places, places the last days in that time. But here's the pushback. No, no, no. Since we're in the last days now, those verses cannot mean they were in the last days then. 1 Peter 1 and verse 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Again, Peter clearly puts the last times in his day. No, no, no. Since we're in the last days now, these verses cannot mean they were in the last days then. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, an amazing verse. Context, Paul here has talked about Old Covenant Israel and how they kept disobeying Yahweh, but then he said those things were for an example for you, for you, the people he's speaking to. So hopefully we won't follow suit. And then he says these things have happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. The end of the ages has come in his time. But again, the five lights push back. No, no, no. Since we're in the end times now, the culmination could not have taken place then, or Paul must have meant something else. 1 John 2, 18. Dear children, it is the last hour. As you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. The Five Lights version. No, no, no. Since the world's about to end, since we're in the last hour now, the last hour couldn't have been then. And since the Antichrist is probably alive now and is just about to come upon the world scene, he could not have existed then. Matthew 10, verse 23. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, he's talking to his disciples, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Five Lights says, no, no, no. Since Jesus is coming in a secret rapture in our future, right around the corner, probably, he could not have possibly come before they finished going through the cities of Israel. Matthew 16, 27 and 28. A couple of verses I just engaged with someone recently. I'll get to that in a moment. For the Son of Man is going to come in His glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, Amen, in the original language, yes it shall be so, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Those, my friends, are some of the clearest some of the most unsquirmiable, meaning you cannot unsquirmiable yourself away from them, verses in all the Bible. But no, no, no. The Five Lights version says, since Jesus is coming in a secret rapture in our future, um, in his Father's glory, he could not have come in his Father's glory with the angels. And he couldn't have rewarded each person according to what they had done. And none of those standing them there would see him coming in his kingdom. A direct denial of the explicit things that Jesus himself said. So this individual on Facebook, decent guy, doesn't, you know, doesn't use ad hominem attacks, doesn't condemn people or call them heretics that I've seen. I appreciate that. But he did, you know, the classic thing first, you know, Matthew 27, 28. Well, one of the verses, but yes, Son of Man is going to come into glory of those angels, reward each person. That's clearly a, a second coming meaning for him, second coming in the future verse. But when he said, truly, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming, that was in the past. Because you just can't get around it. So the many people put those verses at, um, you know, a few, few days later at the Mount of Transfiguration or Pentecost, which just doesn't, doesn't work. I'm not going to get into that here. But I kind of pressed him on that and I explained why it doesn't work. And he said, well, you know, Jesus was you know, splitting up those, those verses like I just suggested. And I, and I said to him, you mean, like within two sentences, he like switched, switched time to thousands of years later? And the guy, oh yeah, the biblical writers did that all the time. All the time. They're just talking and, you know, first century, whoo, thousands of years later, first century, thousands of years later, they do it all the time. Really? Really? Now they have to in order for dispensationalism or amillennialism 
or post-millennialism or partial preterism to work. But does that really make any sense? Do, do we talk to people that way? A conversation with somebody about some events and then suddenly I, I jump, you know, thousands of years into the future. And, there, there's a, and then I'll just close with this. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Matthew 24, 34, what was included in all those things? Destruction of the temple, false prophets, messiahs, pestilence, wars and rumors of wars, famine, earthquakes, the gospel being preached to the end of the world, oikomene, the known world at that time, a.k.a. The Roman Empire, uh, what else was to happen? The, the abomination of desolation that Jesus said they would see when you see. But the Five Lights says, no, no, no. This generation did pass away before all those things happened, so Jesus must have been talking about something else, a future generation, a future race. Do you see the problem? Sometimes we're told to go back to the Star Trek analogy. There are five lights so many times and over and over and over and over again. Even though when we look at it, we only see four. That we start thinking, you know. And even a bigger problem with dispensationalism because that's where most Christians start. So they're told the false paradigm over and over and over and over over before they actually see the scriptures themselves if they ever even look at them themselves. Well, maybe the analogy helped, maybe it didn't. I continue to encourage, look at scripture, compare it with other scripture. It's more important than what you've been taught, if it differs. It's more important than your, than your denomination, your affiliation, your tradition, your creeds, if you adhere to creed, or than what your pastor told you. And by the way, in these videos, don't believe the things I say just because I'm saying them. Go back to the scriptures, please. Ultimately, it's not important what I believe or what you believe if it contradicts the scriptures. What's important is, what did Jesus believe? What did the apostles believe? What did the Old Testament prophets and other writers believe? That's what matters. And it's not hard to understand if we can get rid, again, of, of what we've been told. that so many, And it's not all false, but so many false things. If we can set those presuppositions aside, it really is not difficult to see this. And so, as we begin to, to wrap up this series on dispensational teaching, I truly believe after many years of studying eschatology, admittedly more intensely sometimes than others, that the dispensational system is simply wrong, but it's not only simply wrong, it's, it's deceiving. It paints pictures, images, a world that does not exist. It leads to a worldview. And I'll give you a prominent example like John, John MacArthur. And I know um, John MacArthur may be, I was thinking about this the other day, I, may be the most popular American preacher. I mean, if you were just to kind of take a poll of, of some of the, you know, some of the biggies, he, he might be right up there at the crest. When I was early in my Christianity, I learned a lot from John MacArthur. And, and I like some of his teaching, and, and um, obviously many, many, many people do. But I've come to believe that especially, and I, I don't know if it's because he's gotten older, I'm not, I'm not meaning to be like unkind, but sometimes when people get older, they just get kind of crotchety and grumpy. I don't know if it's that or what it is, but he, he has gotten so dire and so doomsday in his teaching, and it comes from his dispensationalism. And he has a, a video, and, and, and I, I've talked to a, a, you know, a couple of you that might even tune into this channel sometimes, and you've seen this too. He's got this video, and he says, he's talking about Christians, he says, we lose down here. We lose down here. The church is not victorious down here. Well, hogwash. Baloney. I mean, but that's where dispensationalism leads to, and in a sense, it almost celebrates that we lose down here and everything is falling apart. And I have heard at least a couple of people say these things specifically. I know everything's terrible, and now we might think particularly of what's going on with, the, with gender and the LBGT 
whatever initials happen to be there in that day, uh, movement and other things and the kind of things taught in, in, in schools and, and uh, you know, all these things that, that, that are in and of themselves definitely not something we want to celebrate. But it's almost like, and I've heard people say this, and I, and I, you know, this stuff is so wrong and I wish it weren't happening, but it proves that the end times are here and that Jesus is coming back soon. And that is what dispensational teaching leads to. It leads to MacArthur saying, we lose down here. And, like, and even when he says it, he looks so grumpy and he looks hopeless and helpless and desperate himself when he says it. In spite of dispensationalism's brief history, I mean, we're talking a couple hundred years at best. The volume has been so loud that many people, including me, have been taken in by its errors. We've been convinced that Christians with other views don't take the Bible seriously. It's been assumed in much of America's Christian culture. Well, of course dispensational premillennialism is right. Don't you know anything? Can't you look out your window and see how horrible things are, first of all? And these are videos for another time. Did you know that in so many ways, that are documented ways, data-driven ways, the world is getting so much better? You want to talk about, have you ever looked at world history before Jesus came on the scene? You want to talk about barbarism. But I digress. I'm being repetitive, I know. It's, it's important that you at least consider, if you haven't already, and, and help your family and friends. You know, do it as lovingly as you can. Like I always say, uh, be on offense, but don't be offensive. I plead with you, you know, if you're someone still in dispensationalism, go back to the scriptures again, like the Bereans. Just even the few I've shared in this video might do it. To see if what you've been taught is true. And those of you that aren't dispensationalists, you know, encourage your family members, friends, co-workers. To go back to the scriptures. Now, let me just give you a couple closing statements that need to be made, and I, I don't want to break up this video, so it may go over just a few minutes longer than some. But we need to keep this line of reasoning. One has to do with the prophecy of the kingdom of God from Daniel 2. Very brief overview. King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebi, if you're a VeggieTales fan, had a dream that no one could interpret. It didn't help that not only did he want them to interpret the dream, but he wanted them to tell him what he had dreamed. Talk about pressure. But amazingly, Daniel does it, and of course gives credit. He says, I can't interpret this, but my God can. And it's about this statue. And, and I'll go over this kind of quickly because a lot of you will, will know about this. But he has this, it, 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 the head is gold, chest and arms silver, torso and thighs bronze, legs were iron, feet were iron, and clay. Daniel told the king this represented four kingdoms. Now, with the exception of a very few outliers that I'm aware of, there is almost universal agreement among Bible people that the four kingdoms represented that Nebuchadnezzar saw were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Again, very few would disagree with that. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's right, but a very strong case can be made that it is. And the next thing that happened is this. Daniel 2.44. Again, bear with me. We just... we. I can't break the video here. Daniel 2.44 In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. <laughs> Did you hear that? That will never be destroyed. I'm thinking of that because Daniel 12.7 talks about the power of the holy people will be completely shattered and destroyed. And uh, most people would see that Daniel Texas future. Let me ask you a question. When is the church destroyed? When is the church shattered? Never. So, he goes on, Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. Again, Daniel 2.44. Now, while it's tempting to delve further into Daniel, my purpose is to delineate the dispensational doctrine. How's that for alliteration? Well, as I previously have stated, there's agreement regarding these kingdoms. There's also consensus that God's kingdom would be set up in the time of those kings and would crush them. It's pretty hard to debate something so clear in the text. The problem, however, is that in dispensationalism, God's plan doesn't quite work out the way he intended it to. The kingdom was offered in Jesus' time, Jesus, of course, being the king, but Israel rejected Jesus and the kingdom, so God had to postpone the offer until another time. Does that even make sense? 
Nebuchadnezzar prays something that speaks to this directly. Daniel 4, 34 and 35. Again, stay with me. This is too important. Daniel 4, 34 and 35. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generations to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? I want to emphasize a couple things from this prayer. A prayer, no less, from a pagan king who's bringing glory to Yahweh. And he literally had to lose his mind before becoming humble enough to eventually worship the one true God. He said, all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases. And then he said, no one can hold back his hand and say to him, what have you done? No one can hold back his hand. Does this no one include the Jews to whom the kingdom was offered? Can Yahweh really do as he pleases or not? I don't know how to avoid a head-on collision with God's sovereignty if one holds to dispensationalism. Here are some verses from Isaiah that also must be wrestled with. Remember the former things. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, there is no other. I'm God, there's no one like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Does the God whose purpose will stand have to change his plans when people reject them? I would hope these scriptures would be enough to convince anyone, but if not, one other passage from the lips of Jesus himself ought to make adherents of this view, dispensationalism, extremely nervous. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What did Jesus mean by the time was fulfilled? If not, the time was fulfilled. But what time? The time of God's kingdom, which again, almost all Bible people agree on. What they don't agree on, apparently, is whether or not God can actually make good on his plans or if he needs to alter them if they're rejected. This is a big deal. Brothers and sisters, it's no small thing to undermine God's ability to accomplish his purposes. God's kingdom did come, and it's been here ever since. Christians are the ambassadors of this kingdom and are ruling and reigning with him through the power of the Holy Spirit, often referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Sometimes it helps me to think of the Spirit as the governor of Christ's spiritual kingdom. This kingdom is growing and will continue to grow. If this is true, there can be no future millennial kingdom and there's no special prophetic place for the nation of Israel. Matthew 21, 43, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, ethnic Israel, given to a people who will produce its fruit, believing Israelites and Gentiles coming in. That one verse packs quite a punch. Jesus told the Israelites, the Jews, that the kingdom was going to be taken away from them and only the remnant would be part of his new spiritual kingdom. The true Israel, the Israel of God, made up of believing Jews and Gentiles, became part of Christ's kingdom at that time. Since that time, as there are no longer Jews and Gentiles, anyone who believes and is born again is part of the kingdom Christ brought and taught. Jesus said nothing that would lead us to believe his kingdom would be postponed for hundreds and thousands, many thousands of years. And there is not one verse in the entire New Testament that I'm aware of that even hints that the kingdom will one day be returned to national Israel. Not one. In these and other statements, 
Jesus made it clear the kingdom was at hand and it was spiritual. If this is true, there is no future earthly millennial kingdom. If you're in Christ, you are a citizen of Christ's kingdom now. Now, again, thank you for your patience. This next thing I say may be the most controversial thing I've said about modern day Israel to this point, but it's far too important not to bring up. Again, ideas have consequences. According to dispensational teaching, it is necessary to bless the nation of Israel regardless of what that nation is doing. There's a belief if America blesses Israel, America will be blessed. But if America does not bless Israel, she will be cursed. This idea is based on Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Genesis 12, verse 3, rather. Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Well, if the Lord had been speaking to Israel, but he wasn't. He was speaking to Abraham, a Gentile. And further, the Israel of God is made up of believing Jews and Gentiles. There is no special or chosen place for the nation of Israel today. There is no holy land anymore. We worship God in Christ. He alone is holy. He is the temple in which we worship God. Now, we go to one, one more text. One more text and we'll wrap this up. Famous story of Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. And a lot of it that is emphasized often in teaching should be emphasized. A story how Jesus radically changed this woman's life. But there's more to that story. John 4, 21-23. Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Yet a time is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. When would what Jesus told this woman be reversed? When did he say, but there's a yet future time when people will once again worship the Father in Jerusalem in a rebuilt temple, and that national Israel would again reach the zenith she had under King David in her past? Feel free to look. Search the New Testament scriptures far and wide. This is a great thing to do in any circumstance. Search the scriptures, but you're not going to find it. You may protest. It's not in the New Testament, but it's in the Old Testament. And this is precisely why it is crucial that we allow the inspired New Testament writers to interpret the inspired Old Testament prophets. If we allow the apostles and Christ himself to interpret the Old Testament for us, we will come to the same conclusion. The dispensational system is something that simply cannot be justified in the scriptures. Back to Israel just briefly. Are there times when our nation should support Israel politically as a democracy? Sure, there are times, but not because it has anything to do with the end times or for religious reasons. Do you know, Eric, here's a resource for you. This guy, by the way, is not someone who holds to fulfill eschatology. He's not a preterist. He may even be a dispensationalist of some stripe. His name's Gary Burgess. But he's, he wrote a book called Whose Land Is It Anyway? I think that's what it's called. And he points out in that book, and there are other resources, that do you know that some Palestinian Christians have been treated very, very badly and, and you know, told to, to leave because they're in the way of a modern-day Israel trying to expand its territory where most of the people of modern-day Israel are not even believing Jews? It's a secular state. These are the consequences of dispensational teaching. Well, besides the fact that blessing and cursing of Israel is a misunderstanding in Genesis 12, there's something else that should be obvious, but may not be if we haven't thought it through. And I know some of you may be watching this not from America. I'm just focusing on America because that's, that's where dispensationalism is most prevalent. Has America blessed Israel? Absolutely. We have been much of the time behind them, had their back, and poured multiple 
billions of dollars into this nation. I heard recently something like 12 billion a year. Billion! That's the admission of Christian Zionist organizations, which are an outgrowth of dispensational teaching. Let me ask you, if, the, if it goes like this, when America blesses Israel, America will be incredibly blessed. We have done that in spades. Is America incredibly blessed? Have we, have we seen great, great fruit from this? I think at least most Christians, if not Americans in general, would agree that at the present time, our nation needs a little help. There are many incredible things about being American, and we, we benefit greatly from the work of our forefathers, the dream they had of America. But honestly, if the state of our nation was tied to how we bless Israel, that's my point, man, we would be just going gangbusters here. So politically, and more important, theologically, this main tenet of dispensationalism falls flat on its face. Well, again, thank you for your patience in this video. I just, I, I didn't, I couldn't find a good way to break it. So that concludes this five-part series, why we believe what we believe. Again, how, how did we get here? How did so many of us buy dispensationalism? Hook, line, and sinker. We've traced some of the history of dispensationalism. We've talked about the rapture. We've talked about the millennial kingdom. We've talked about Israel. I hope it's been helpful for you. I hope I've taught it in a way that's clear and in a way that helps you to teach others. So thank you again. Um, please like, share, subscribe to this channel. It will help me a lot. I have some, some really exciting things that are coming up that I want to share with you but need to do some more praying and, and working through some more of the details first. But I, I so appreciate you watching and, and just your, uh, your kindness to me and that these videos are, are being helpful to you. It's one final reminder, I'm a subscriber 125. Again, if you want to uh, let me know what kind of video you want me to do next, I will do it. But for now, Pastor Joel saying bye for now.